Hi everyone, welcome to Hub Bytes. I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist from PsychScene. If you're new to this channel, we cover all things psychiatry and mental health related. So if that's your thing, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Of course, hit the notification button as well, so that when we release a new video, that you're notified immediately. Now, what we're gonna talk about today is nutraceuticals. Really important topic in psychiatry. We often think about psychiatry as psychotherapy and medications, but it's important that we learn more about nutraceuticals. So without further ado, let's jump into what are nutraceuticals. Nutraceuticals is a broad umbrella term that is used to describe any product derived from food sources with extra health benefits in addition to the basic nutritional value found in foods. The term nutraceutical combines two words of nutrient, which is a nourishing food component, and pharmaceutical, which is a medical drug. The philosophy behind nutraceuticals is to focus on prevention, according to the saying by Greek physician Hippocrates, as you know, the, the Hippocratic Oath that all doctors take as well, known as the father of medicine, who said, let food be your medicine. And we know that diet plays such an important part in uh, psychiatry as a whole, in health as a whole, of course, but in psychiatry uh, as well. In fact, there is very good evidence for, for prevention of depression through the Mediterranean diet. For those of you who have, uh, for example, heard of uh, Harahachibu, uh, which is the Japanese version, or, or it basically talks about uh, eating until you're 80% full, and that is closely linked to um, a neuroplasticity, um, positive neuroplasticity. Uh, as well. So there's a range of these uh, aspects related to diets. You know, you might have heard of intermittent fasting. So the way we eat and what we eat is, is really, really important in psychiatry as a whole for our brain. So let's look at what are the categories of, of nutraceuticals. Now, the definition of nutraceuticals and their related products generally depends on their source. So these products can be classified on the basis of their natural sources, pharmacological conditions, as well as chemical constitution of the products. So depending on what they're used to. So most often they're categorized into four categories. So firstly, let's look at, um, the first one is dietary supplements. Now these represent a product that contains nutrients derived from food products and is often concentrated in liquid, capsule form, powder, or pill form. Many of us know this, obtained over the counter, at pharmacies, supermarkets even. Functional food includes whole foods and fortified as well as enriched or enhanced dietary components that may reduce the risk of chronic disease and provide a health benefit beyond the traditional nutrients it contains. Then we have medical food is formulated to be consumed or administered internally under the supervision of a qualified physician. So these, these kinds of things are often used as supplements, particularly in uh, hospitals, for example, when uh, individuals may not be able to obtain their caloric requirements from, say, just uh, a meal, um, or they're not able to actually have that meal properly. It's intended to use a specific dietary management of a disease or condition for which distinctive nutritional requirements established by the medical evaluation on the basis of recognized scientific principles. So even, uh, say, individuals with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or celiac disease, etc., so specific dietary requirements for that. Uh, or metabolic uh, diseases. Then we have pharmaceuticals. Now this is F-A-R-M. Are medically valuable components produced from modified agricultural crops or animals. The term is a combination of the words farm and pharmaceuticals. Proponents of this concept are convinced that using crops or possibly even animals as pharmaceutical factories is much more cost effective than conventional methods with higher revenue for agricultural producers. So What's important is, I mean, when we think about it, you know, we often talk about pharmaceuticals, um, you know, the profit based making, you know, lots of profits, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But nutraceuticals is also a very, very big business. We consume a huge amount of over the counter supplements uh, in a range of uh, aspects. And it's, it's much more regular. And if you look at um, how much they cost, there is a significant margin there as well. So, you know, again, this is not about um, criticizing any, any particular one component. This is the economic landscape uh, that we 
that we live in. And essentially, we're always looking at um, different ways in which how we can improve health, uh, mental health, physical health, etc. And we're influenced by a range of things uh, that we see as well, whether it's social media, etc. Now, what are the nutraceuticals that have a role in psychiatry. So I'll cover this based on the evidence base uh, that's available at the moment. But of course, as in all things, I always mention that any any medication or supplement that I talk about, it's important that you discuss it with your doctor because even supplements, even though they might be thought of as natural, can have side effects. So firstly, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so omega-3 fatty acids are essentially PUFAs, which are polyunsaturated fatty acids obtained from dietary sources such as salmon, sardines, and anchovies. So, you know, we often talk about uh, overfishing and um, uh, because of all of these things, the, most likely the nutrient value has, has dropped down significantly in, in what we consume. People who don't eat fish can have it through fish oil capsules. And omega-3 fatty acid levels have been reported to be low in a range of mental disorders. It is mainly used for bipolar depression and major depression. There's good evidence for uh, augmentation. So this is not a substitute for mainstream treatment through psychological treatments, uh, lifestyle management, and medication. This is as an augmentation strategy or as a supplement. And as you can see here, omega-3 can boost the effectiveness of antidepressants. Now, when we think about uh, omega-3 fatty acids, it's important that we think about the uh, optimal balance between the polyunsaturated fatty acids um, as well, um, the DHA component, um, the EPA component, etc. Then we think about tryptophan and 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan. Uh, so here 5-HTP is used in the treatment of depression, anxiety, panic disorder, sleep disorders, obesity, myoclonus, and serotonin syndrome. Now, again, now this has been stated, um, but it does not mean that this is at the exclusion of mainstream treatments. For example, serotonin syndrome, we can't prescribe 5-HTP and treat serotonin syndrome. Serotonin syndrome, you know, we, it, it can be a serious condition. Um, so this is a, uh, there is some evidence for it, but it's not substitute for um mainstream treatment. Now, a few studies also indicate it's potentially neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. But um, some of you might, might know that tryptophan was associated with uh, eosinophilic myalgic syndrome and therefore sort of fell out of favor as a, as a supplement. Now, this tryptophan for depression and anxiety came from um, the studies that showed that tryptophan depletion uh, led to uh, an increased risk of depression. Now, tryptophan is... Um, a supplement that can only be obtained exogenously. We do not manufacture tryptophan. Um, so therefore, we need to obtain it in our diet. Next, we have SAM-E. Uh, this is quite commonly used nowadays. So S-adenosyl L-methionine. -meth so this is essentially a important um, component of the methylation pathway. And when we think about the methylation pathway, the methylation pathway is necessary for the production of important neurotransmitters, dopamine and noradrenaline. Now, we'll see vitamin B12 is linked here and folate is linked here as well. SAMI has also been suggested to be of use in shortening the onset of standard antidepressant therapy. And SAMI is generally used for depression. Now, SAMI has been mentioned in some guidelines as well for depression treatment. So, SAMI, the important thing about the methylation pathway is that we want it to functionally produce dopamine and noradrenaline. Why? Because dopamine and noradrenaline are important components in the frontal lobe to um, help with cognition, mood, pleasure, hedonic drive. All those components that we don't have lead to depression. If we don't have, lead to depression. So if SAMI isn't there, or similarly, we'll see later, vitamin B12 and folate aren't there, then the pathway moves towards the production of homocysteine. And homocysteine is both neurotoxic and vasculotoxic. Uh, damages endothelium, so increased rates of heart disease, for example, um, increased rates of possible migraine, stroke, they're all sort of associated. And of course, neurological disorders, um, uh, you know, can lead to neuropathy, for example, or can um, also be associated with depression. 
Then we have DHEA. Now DHEA is really, really interesting because it sort of reduces the excitotoxic um, activity in the brain. And, uh, you know, I recently wrote an article on neuroplasticity where DHEA plays an important um, part. So DHEA is uh, dehydroepiandrostone. Tyrone. Um, its effects on the body are similar to those of testosterone, and they've been postulated to have a neuroprotective effect. And research suggests the possible role. Again, it's not mainstream in schizophrenia, dementia, and depressive disorders. So these, uh, the important thing here is that with many of these studies, we're not looking at very, very large studies. And hence, it's difficult to generalize these for just mainstream treatment. NAC. Now, NAC is a, again, Please do have a listen to the video by Professor Burke on our channel. Uh, it's a very, very popular video. And acetylcysteine um, at the right dose has been shown to be beneficial in a range of um, disorders. So NAC is a powerful antioxidant, which is um, it's not made in the body. And it reduces oxidative stress and neuroinflammation. And it supports its beneficial effects in obsessive compulsive spectrum disorders. So it's interesting in the comment section as well, where in the video in NAC, people have used it for a range of things like substance use, where there's some evidence base. Um, evidence base in autism spectrum disorders, you know, where repetitive ticks, uh, repetitive uh, behaviors might be present. Obsessive compulsive disorders, depression. Um, and doses sort of vary between 1,600 to 2,400 milligrams uh, per day. So sort of hard doses are required. And um, as we know previously, it was classified as a sort of nutraceutical supplement. But now the FDA, uh, it's not classified. It's classified as a medication and hence, you know, not available just over the counter to be purchased. Um, so that's NAC. And acetylcysteine do have a, a listen to the range of videos that we have on NAC. Next, we have phosphatidylserine, and researchers have found that phosphatidylserine produce, uh, provides significant improvements in memory, learning, concentration, word recall, and mood in individuals with age-related cognitive decline. Again, not mainstream. We're talking about some evidence. We have choline. Choline is present in almost every tissue of the body. It is essential for normal functions of all cells, and it may be useful in dementia. Melatonin. Now, this naturally occurring um, substance regulates circadian rhythms in the body, such as sleep-wake cycle. Um, now, melatonin, as we know, is, it's interestingly, serotonin is broken down to melatonin. So when we think about the pathway, this is really interesting because we have tryptophan, which is the supplement, and tryptophan gets converted to serotonin, and serotonin then gets converted to melatonin. And we have uh, zinc, magnesium, and B6 as important cofactors uh, in the conversion from serotonin to melatonin. So you can see why it also assists with sleep. Um, we covered zinc, magnesium, B6 in PMDD, um, where it uh, similarly do the same reason where it helps in the cofactor in the production of serotonin. Now, melatonin, there's a range of doses at which it's prescribed, but we have long-acting, we have short-acting as well. Uh, we prescribe in clinical practice quite a lot. It's very, very beneficial. Um, and it improves, as you can see here, it is a naturally occurring substance, uh, regulates circadian rhythms, very, very important aspect. Do have a listen to the neurobiology of sleep uh, that we've done on this channel. And it improves sleep quality in people with schizophrenia, major depression, and seasonal affective disorder. It's also used in children, um, uh, children with ADHD, for example, autism benefits there. And this supplement may be an alternative to drugs, to medications, especially for children and the elderly. Uh, so it can be helpful. Then we have St. John's wort. Now, St. John's wort, uh, what's really important here is that it is uh, available over the counter. It's produced from an extract of the plant known as Hypericum perforatum, and it is helpful for in mild to moderate depression. And important thing, St. John's wort has a lot of interactions with other medications, warfarin, for example. But the other thing is St. John's wort cannot be prescribed with antidepressants because it can result in serotonin syndrome for example, okay, so side effects can be present. Then we have a range of vitamins and minerals. So here, as you can see, deficiencies in niacin, thiamine, vitamin B12, and folate are known to have adverse neuropsych effects. So um, in my clinical practice, I do consider vitamin deficiencies, iron, all of these things are very, very important to take into account. Vitamin D, for example, a calcium, magnesium, phosphate, you know, a, a, dietary history, etc. Um, 
Some vitamins are necessary for the synthesis of other nutraceuticals, as I mentioned, zinc, magnesium, B6, for example, melatonin, uh, vitamin B12 folate along the um, methylation pathway. Folic acid is useful for depression, and when combined with an antidepressant, folic acid sup uh, supplements can boost uh, symptom relief. And this is L-methyl folate, and often 10 to 15 milligrams is required, so higher doses are required. Then we, have, we know that low serum folates can be associated with Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia. Um, so often we find that individuals over the age of 65 with any memory problems, we often carry out a panel that includes vitamin B12 and folate. Calcium dysregulation also may be an important uh, in, in a range of disorders such as dementia and depression, may be used in other depressive disorders such as schizophrenia, substance use depressive disorder, calcium in PMDD, very valuable magnesium in PMDD. Intake of other micronutrients, iron, magnesium, zinc, have been linked to structural as well as functional development of the brain. Magnesium and zinc consumption improves attention, executive functions, behavioral and emotional problems in children and adolescents. And zinc may be used in children with ADHD. Again, diet is closely linked to ADHD in children. Uh, the presence of, in fact, in the international consensus for ADHD, uh, they have talked about certain dietary aspects, preservatives, colors, ad additives, uh, with a link to ADHD as well. So people clearly describe that if I don't, you know, if I remove this from the child's diet, I notice these particular changes. Um, so there's a lot to, to learn here. So it's important that we take into account nutraceuticals uh, when considering um, managing psychiatric disorders. Thank you very, very much for watching this particular video. I hope that you found it useful. As always, please do discuss any of these aspects with your doctor. I look forward to seeing you in another edition of Hub Bites. If you found this video useful, do leave us a like and subscribe to our channel. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.